Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. This is one of such events. And if you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. So go check it out. Click on this link and you'll see all the events we have in our pipeline. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do it now. It's important. You will get notified about all our future videos. And also maybe just go ahead and like this video because YouTube will start recommending it to others. So please do this as well. And we have an amazing Slack community. So check it out if you want to hang out with other like-minded data enthusiasts. And if you're into machine learning engineering, we have a free course that starts next week, I think, on Monday, next Monday. So there is a link in the description. So check it out, um, check the syllabus. And if you like it, register, it's all free. And during today's presentation, you can ask any question you want. There is a pinned link in the live chat. So click on this link, ask your question, and we'll be cover, we will be covering these questions after the presentation. So that's actually all from my side. So now, I hope the floor is yours. OK, very good. Thanks. Um, just let me share the screen first. OK. That's good. Do you, like, can everyone see it? Perfect, I, I can see it, yes. Perfect, cool. Then that's good. Okay, Alexey. Um, well, first of all, thanks a lot, like, for inviting me here. Um, to be honest, like, it's something that I wanted to do for a while, so it's always good, you know, like, to tick that and to also see you, like, personally. So uh, that's always good. Um, and hello, like, to everyone who is watching this live and also in the stream later on. So um, yeah. So today I will be talking about a subject that is, you know, pretty close to my heart. That is um, probabilistic demand forecasting, right? Um, at scale. Um, why? Because, you know, like this field is, you know, like, an, like a kind of an intersection of all of my, you know, background that is from economics to, you know, like forecasting to also more research, uh, let's say more recent methods such as um, deep learning. I mean, I think, you know, this is like a very good uh, kind of a niche topic that kind of picks everything. And we've been, you know, seeing a lot of, um, let's say, breakthroughs in it. There's a lot of research going on. So a lot of, you know, uh, things going forward. But I still believe that, you know, there are a lot of open areas. And today's presentation is mainly about, you know, putting um, some of this, uh, this points. Hopefully, you know, we have some interesting questions and then we have, like, we open this uh, conversation here, but also offline. Yeah. So uh, just a small presentation about myself. So I'm Hagop. Uh, I'm an applied scientist. I currently work at uh, Zalando, more specifically in Zalando Fulfillment Solutions. And uh, yeah, so I've been building, you know, ML and applied science products for the last five years, worked a bit for um, OLX with uh, Alexei, for example, Delivery Hero, and then Zalando recently. Um, I'm passionate about, you know, everything that does uh, data science, deep learning, green tea, cycling, and running. So if you're interested in any of these, please contact me as well uh, after the presentation. Cool. So the outline of today is, you know, we're really gonna take all the parts in the title, right? And then we're gonna go through uh, each of them and then try to connect them all together, right? This means that, you know, we're gonna go through first the problem of demand forecasting and e-commerce. What does it mean? Um, you know, what type of covariates we can use for demand forecasting? Um, we're going to review, uh, uh, like, the initial methods of determining forecasting and why, you know, it's not very useful for uh, demand forecasting, like, in e-commerce. Then, you know, we're going to present you one type of solution that is uh, embracing uncertainty with a probabilistic modeling. And then, you know, just view, uh, like, give you an overview of a potential training and serving flow that we use currently, in, like, in my team, that, you know, that you can also have a, uh, have a thought about. So, cool. Um, the problem of, you know, um, demand forecasting in e-commerce, right? Um, the first thing that I want to say about it is that um, it's actually like a very important point in many businesses and many e-commerce businesses. It's actually like a core input to uh, logistics and planning uh, uh, problematics, right? Um, just to give you an idea of how it can be used, like the first big thing that comes up often is inventory optimization, right? Um, so it's going to, so it's going to be, you know, like an input to this downstream uh, application. And here, usually we'll try to answer questions like, Hey, um, you know, what, what's the optimal uh, inventory level for all of my products? You know, when, uh, when should I inbound? When, you know, I sh when should I replenish my stock? And, you know, where I should optimally allocate my, uh, current stock in my network of warehouses, right? So it's a big operation research topic, very traditional that, you know, relies heavily on demand forecasting and ideally probabilistic demand forecasting. Um, the second thing that comes up often is capacity planning, right? Um, you know, all of these warehouses and logistics uh, systems actually, you know, work with humans, right? Real humans, which means that, you know, we have to plan it correctly, right? If we under plan or over plan, the entire, you know, distribution flow can be a bit messed up. And, you know, we have unoptimal uh, customer service. 
Um, the third point um, that can be used for and is often used is basically a certain planning, right? This is more about um, like the brand itself or the partner or like the person who owns the stock, right? Where you try to understand, you know, okay, what products I need to invest in or, or, or you know, what products are likely to be successful in the next coming season or months, right? So relatively traditional, but very important, you know, uh, problematic. Um, so usually like the first question that, you know, we need to answer, and this is kind of like the elephant in the room is, um, does demand mean sales, right? Um, there's a big, uh, let's say, confusion about this. And the first answer is it can be, right? In the perfect scenario, right, where you have stocks that allow you to cover all of the, like, you know, at any given time, all of the demand, then yes, ideally your demand, you know, will uh, directly lead to sales. They will convert to sales, right? So you, in this case, demand will equal to sales. But, you know, this is perfect scenario, right? And things in life never gets, you know, easy. In reality, like you're going to have something called stockouts where, you know, for X, Y, Z reason, you're going to have stockouts. And the stockout will cause the big problem is that demand will only be partially observed, right? So demand will then be kind of decomposed into uh, two segments. The actual sales that you, you know, that, that you're able to, to basically fulfill. So you, that, that you're able to fill the demand. This is known because you see and, and you record it over time. The other part is what we call lost sales, right? So like th this is the demand that you would probably never know uh, what could have been because you never, you know, achieve it, right? Because this is out of stock. But ideally, you know, you want to maximize your demand because you know, that's how you want to run your business, right? So we have these two components. I think it's so far, right? But um, in reality, you know, it even can get more complex, right? Um, based on the business setup and, and, your, and, and, the, and the way that you, know, you work, you can have other components that can make things complicated. Like for example, in the case of Zalando and also many others, right? We have what we call returns, right? So your like your demand can be decomposed into obviously the lost sales that you don't observe, but can be sales that you know you cash in, but also products that go out of your warehouse, but for some reason people don't like it, you know, they send it back. But this, you know, thing has to be processed at the outbound, you know, at the at the warehouse level, even if you don't cash in. So this is what we call outbound, right? So from demand, we ended up having demand, right? Lost sales, sales, and outbound, right? Like this entire um, um, logic, you know, can get complicated. And, you know, you're like, okay, Hagop, you know, why are you, you know, giving us a class on, on, on terminology? Well, because that's important. Um, you know, what you're trying to, uh, 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 I mean, Terminology is important because you're basically defining your target, right? Before even jumping into all type of models, I would really love to make sure that, okay, we understand what we're trying to model. And unfortunately, it's very easy to get confused about these terms, right? Um, because mainly different stakeholders mean and want different things, right? Like for example, for inventory optimization purposes, most of the time what you want is demand. You really want to maximize the full scale of your demand, right? For marketing purposes, they you know, can be interested back in sales numbers, Whereas in capacity and, 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 and operational uh, uh, downstream applications, they want more about outbound, right? Even if you don't cash in, they still want to process, know what, what, like what will go out of the workhouse and what will be you know, processed. So the, first, so the first thing is that um, you know, it matters because it matters to the different people, right? And it's really good that as a data scientist, you know, we approach this in a, in a proper and, and precise way. The second thing is, without any surprise, um, if you take the wrong target, right, by chance, well, you will end up having bad outcomes with respect to your inventory thingy. And um, I'm going to prove it with a you know, very simple example that is very common. Um, let's say, you know, we're interested in an in, um, inventory optimization downstream application, right, where we want to set up um, optimal um, replenishment policy. And in this case, you know, we use sales as forecast, right? So we so we we really try to use sales, so historical sales, to forecast the future sales, right? Okay. Then we take this forecasted sales and then we plug that into like the downstream application, right? And we basically define our optimal inventory based on the sales, right? What this happens is that this will lead you to um, having uh, stockouts because you know sales are not fully demand; they actually are partially observing demand, and you will actually end up having more stockouts, which will lead to potentially lower sales. Right, and then this never ends. This is actually known as 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 the curse of lost sales in uh, supply chain theory, and it's a big big issue because this will really lead you into like a spiral down effect, right? And it's gonna be really difficult to get out of this unless for you know you really artificially bump your stocks and you really end up observing demand at some point. But if you get in, you know, stuck into this, it's gonna be very difficult you know to really observe demand, and then you have big like like big troubles. Um, this situation can happen often, and it's a 
big um, big big problem. It's a very you know, well documented field in the in the in the theory, and ideally you really need to pay attention to this when you're modeling in your you know applied real life application. Um, does it you know does it always like that right? Actually no. Like the case that I gave you is um, only one thing. Um, there are some businesses where you know when the demand is not actually fulfilled because of stock, you actually have back orders. You just register the demand right. And then you can, you know, fulfill it in two or three weeks, right? This can happen potentially in many B2B businesses, but it turns out that unfortunately for B2C e-commerce, you're kind of stuck in this scheme, right? When you don't have sales, your lost sales, you know, you can't observe them. So it's a big, big issue, right? Um, so we in the e-commerce sector have to, you know, tackle this problem. Okay, so this is like the first issue. Um, the second issue is, you know, how can we, you know, recover this, right? How can we recover the map? Um, Simple question is, you know, what are the simplest things that we can do that can actually, you know, help us recover this? Um, the first thing that we can try or, you know, industry tries is simple interpolation or simple um, imputations, right? Let's say you take two points where you observe the band, where you know that you observe it. And then in between all the points, you just interpolate in a linear way, in a quadratic way, in anything that you like, right? Um, the second way is, this one is interesting, is informing on the past and enforcing on the future. What does it mean is that you basically go and create like a dummy indicator variable, let's say one or zero, right? And for, an, for all past observations, where you know that you have stock out, you basically indicate to the model, hey, please incorporate in your learning process that this value is low because we had a stock out, right? So you basically inform on the past uh, observed uh, values. And for the future things, you basically do a trick. Because you're, you know, you're passing this variable as information during prediction time, you basically force this variable to be basically uh, stock out equals zero, right? So you're kind of saying, okay, model, please learn how my demand behaves when I don't have stock outs, right? And try to replicate that because I'm forcing you to do it in the future, uh, uh, you know, um, predictions. That's a second simple approach. The third approach is, you know, if you try to impute with the previously learned model, right? You just take the predictions. And then you update the entire learning on the latest data with the new model that you predict, right? Um, these are the things that you can see in the different books or, you know, on Stack Overflow or even, you know, as, um, as very, like, recommendations to try. Um, but the issue often is, um, how about pay? You know, will it work in all the time? Does it, you know, like, is this like an exact science? Like, the answer is no. There is no guarantees that, you know, this will work, right? This will really depend on your business use case. And, you know, unfortunately, um, I cannot say that it can work in, like in all cases. Um, but if it doesn't work out, if you experiment and, you, and you're not satisfied with the result, then, you know, you're kind of, um, let's say, a bit alone because this, you know, field is, um, let's say, having a very thin literature. Like, I'm just, you know, how, can, how to recover uh, unobserved demand is relatively thin in terms of literature. And, you know, you're kind of let alone on that, which I find a bit sad, uh, given the importance of the problem, right? Um, but, um, yeah, so these are like the simplest things that um, we often try. The second issue with the, well, the third issue with the with, with the demand forecasting in e-commerce is that um, uncertainty, right? Um, there are so many unpredictable factors that will actually, you know, impact your demand that you can't do much about it. Let me give you like a list of ideas. The first one is weather, right? Um, Heat waves too early, too often. People like start buying shorts, like let's say earlier than last year, and and this trend is going up, right? So weather is one factor. It can be customer taste and preferences. You might have you know prepared your stock for the next uh, twelve months, but you know people have different habits, and that's what happens. The third one is economical factors. This is a big one. I think twenty twenty two is a perfect like a perfect example with inflation and uh, you know like a deep in the in the consumer confidence uh, index. We basically feel that in, in many e-commerce, uh, unfortunately, companies. Um, random stuff like pandemics, right? Who would have thought that, you know, pandemics? Uh, it can be positive, right? Like pandemics um, for many uh, e-commerce companies, this was a boom, right? So it can be positive. So you're, you know, but you still have to have the stocks to deal with the positive increase of demand, right? And unfortunately, war. You know, again, 2022, this also can happen and, you know, will impact. So you see that, you know, we have a large spectrum of factors, and I probably didn't uh, list enough, that will impact, you know, your demand and make your exercise or life very complicated. Okay. So that's about, um, you know, the problem. The second question is, okay, how can we incorporate this into, you know, set of features, right? Before even doing modeling, you know, what do I need as data point and potentially, you know, build features from that? 
Um, the first one is very natural, is you know, time series problems. So it means that we have temporal and lagged features. Um, you know, we the first thing we do is we take the autoregressive features, right? Let, let's say this is your demand at time t. Then based on 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 the result of your uh, time series analysis, you might be interested in taking t minus one, t minus two, t minus three, or if you have seasonal component, then you might be interested in taking t minus you know uh, twelve or twenty four, whatever you know. Let's say matches the best your data uh, pattern. Um, you might have temporal indicators, right? Is it the day of the week, the week of the month, the month of the year, the semester? You might have specific dates and events that you want to encode. Is it holidays? We have, you know, any religious festivities coming in, cyber week, summer sales, right? Um, you can be very simple with dummy indicators and have sparse metrics, or, you know, be a bit more clever and, you know, like basically like compute date uh, distances with from today till, you know, that event, for example. So you can really be creative there. Um, okay, then is, you know, you will really try to be a bit more clever, right? And try to incorporate all type of data that will give you hints on the environment, right? Like remember uncertainties come from certain factors and logically we want to you know, capture some of the patterns in that uh, environment, right? So naturally weather and economic features can be super important ones. Uh, it can be observed or so past weather measurement, but it could, can also be future forecast, right? Values that we know for the uh, prediction time. You can take macroeconomic indicators, just go on, you know, on, on, on Stata or any other economical website and have all type of data there, like consumer confidence index, unemployment rate, uh, inflation can be helpful. You can be, you know, a bit more, uh, um, let's say clever, go and take some trends on Google Trends, like industrial level trends, for example, in my case, fashion. It can be on the competitors, you know, that, you know, you have certain brands that you compete against, so you can see how, you know, their, their business is doing, you can get a hint on that. Brands, categories, many things, right? Um, you can even, you know, be creative and go and take, uh, for example, the reported COVID cases, right? Um, so the idea here is pretty simple, as you know, really understand your business and there, you know, go and get all type of data well, that will potentially help you catch some uncertainties. Um, yeah. Then the third level and finally will be um, obviously metadata, right? You want to have static or you know, continuous features about your the time series, right? So if it's a product in my case, like let's say shoes, right? Then you want to have, um, you know, product metadata like price, past and future if you have, same for discount, um, you know, which category is it? Some indicators about uh, like the composition of the shoes or, you know, if you, you know, you, you can even go a bit more advanced and take, for example, neural embeddings, right? For the images that are being used in the postings or, you know, title and description. You can really, you know, can really go into complex uh, features when doing your, 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 you know, your forecasting exercise, given that the model allows it, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're now reaching to the point of, okay, like, okay, we have the problem, right? We know the data. Um, you know, let's try to do it with, uh, with let's say, most, uh, you know, uh, a known way, which is deterministic way. And we're going to see, you know, why this is not particularly useful in the case of uh, uncertainty everywhere. Okay. So what's deterministic, you know, forecasting? In this case, it's, you know, nothing else than point forecast, right? Which means that um, you basically learn values, one point, and you're going to output, you know, one value per, uh, uh, per prediction uh, T. Right, so per prediction time, um, you're most likely gonna use point point loss, right? Functions like let's say uh, mean squared errors during training, and um, you know you will be uh, having a lot of models. Um, um, like the literature is very large on this. Like you can have very simple classical uh, methods like ARIMA exponential smoothing, where mostly you have one model per time series, which you know works well for ten time series. But if you have you know one hundred thousand or one million time series might be difficult to maintain and understand. And also, you know, because they don't really learn from each other and the potential correlation that they are. Um, but then, you know, you can also then jump to more uh, machine learning models um, like XGBoost, uh, or, you know, you can uh, use LightGBM, CatBoost, anything. This obviously requires that you do pretty, pretty uh, extensive, you know, uh, handcrafted features before uh, putting it in the model. Um, and then the last you know, uh, family that is deep learning models, right? That is having a lot of, you know, um, big boom um, where, you know, you, you don't have to do that much feature engineering, but becomes a bit more expensive in terms of computation. Um, you can have models with or without covariates, single shot or recursive, you know, it's, it's really rich. It's really up to you how to build it, right? But the point of this is mainly this thing, right? So 
point forecasting and you know let's see why this is not optimal let's play a game right so let's prove that this is not optimal okay so alexi i'm gonna ask you to respond to my question uh, like in a couple of minutes okay so i first tell you like so okay that um i'm forecasting that this shoe that looks incredibly nice you know is gonna be sold uh for or will have demand in this case for next week of five thousand units okay this is the first information that i gave you uh, like you know very enthusiastically then i tell you okay alexi actually uh you know a few days later i tell you actually i didn't give you all the information right now i believe that you know this value might have you know three potential different distributions right i give you this one around the uh, like the mean value of this one or this one Right. And my question to you, Alexi, is, you know, would you consider the level of noise to be the same uh, on all of the distributions? By the level of noise, you mean like the spread of distribution, right? So how exactly, like using this information, how exactly should I make a decision, like how many pairs of shoes I should buy exactly. and put to the warehouse, right? And then I, uh, that will be very different if the distribution is one, then I would buy maybe five thousand right uh -huh. and for the case of three distribution number three then i would think very carefully like okay i, I <laughs> that... should buy like <laughs> 10 times more just in case exactly alexi yeah. i knew that you you would give the good answer so it was like a very easy bet to play this game with you so that is actually you know like a logical answer that can come up is you know um it tells you nothing about you know noise that are uh, around that prediction right are we you know in a low context uh, of are we in a low noise context? Are we in a high noise context? You know, what's the amount of noise, right? How confidently should I take this forecast that you're giving me? And, you know, and also like you're giving me this, but like how does the confidence, you know, evolve over time, right? Because like you're telling me this, but in five weeks, 10 weeks, 20 weeks, like, you know, like, like would your confidence completely destroy? And where's the point where I should really stop trusting your, your prediction? The answer is, as the nice gift of Borat that tells you, I actually do not know. That's, you know, that's the thing. It tells you literally nothing about the noise, right? About uncertainty and its evolution over time. Um, and this is like the big problem of, of, you know, like deterministic forecasting, right? Is that it will not enable you, you know, to have this, 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 this like this relationship with uh, confidence and noise, you know, understanding, right? And will, at the end, you know, not, uh, not allow you to like to have downstream, let's say, stochastic, uh, application that you know can play with level of uncertainty and that's a, that's a bad thing right especially that what we said previously demand forecasting is all about uncertainty right so um which means that you know we come to the solution now um you know we basically have to embrace this uncertainty with probabilistic modeling like, you know it's not fatalistic we can you know live with it it's it's fine we just have to you know find a workaround okay so um just that you know we kind of remind um you know what does that we want right like like our needs um we really want to have um the level of the noise right at every point of forecast is it you know low is it medium context is it high context right um we also want to see the evolution of the noise right at t t plus one t plus two t plus three doesn't change is it constant does it decrease increase many things are possible we really want to understand that and also, you know, having this, we will open ourselves, you know, to, to having uh, potentially many uh, uh, downstream uh, stochastic applications uh, possible, right? Such as inventory uh, optimization and Monte Carlo simulations. There is, you know, very common, right? So this is what we want. And, you know, before jumping, let me maybe just recap visually the problem mm -hmm. that, you know, we all see the, the tenants there. Um, so we have a prediction model, right? We have historical values, past target values, and what we want in the future is we want to have, let's say, a mean or a median prediction. And around that, we want to have some level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding of the noise. So we want what we call prediction intervals, right? Or confidence intervals, if you prefer. Um, and to do this, we have a model, right? And we might have data that we observe only for the past. We might have data that we observe for the past and future that can be continuous or categorical. And we might have, you know, features that are constant to the tar like to the like to the uh, to the time series, right? Like in the case of the product, it can be the category of the product. This is going to be shoes, whatever, you know. So we have, you know, like this constants with this value, and then we want to have this right top corner, right? We want to predict with this confident intervals. Okay. So how can we do that? Um, well, probabilistic forecasting methods, right? Um, there are two big families. One is frequentist uh, method, and the other one is Bayesian methods, right? 
Um, and today, you know, I will mostly cover about this um, because the literature is going a lot in this direction. And, you know, um, I tend to work with this. So this is something I feel comfortable to talk about. So, you know, let's focus on this today. Um, basically, there are two ways to do it. The first one is um, learning distribution parameters. And then the second one is learning quantiles of the distribution. Let's have a deep dive on it. Okay. So the first method I said is, you know, learning distribution parameters, right? In this case, it means that um, for every, you know, point T of the forecast, I want to output the parameters of the distribution for that time. Distribution can be, you know, if it's a Gaussian, it can be mu and, uh, and, 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 and sigma, but it can also be like a lambda for a Poisson distribution, right? It can be any distribution that you want. Gaussian, binomial, uh, Poisson, it can be a T student, Anything that you know you like or you think it's you know it's it's a good thing. Um, by the way, that's one of the you know the downside is that you need to make assumptions, right? You need to really take strong assumptions about distribution. I believe that can work if you know you have a limited amount of time series that you know you can test or you can really measure. But if you end up having you know um, hundreds of thousands or you know millions, making that you know all of them will follow a certain distribution and one distribution is for me like, you know, a strong take, right? Um, again, if by chance all of this time theory do follow that distribution, then you're, you know, good. Otherwise it's, it's not optimal basically, okay? So we have that distribution parameters and how do we do this? We, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. We just do, you know, uh, we, we maximize the local likelihood, right? Um, and even if, you know, this is possible uh, with, uh, with ARIMA and, and uh, expansion smoothing, well, you know, like the main family of models that, you know, we see in the literature and are, you know, implemented is basically like DL, right? Like just to give you some examples, we have um, Aaron Gaussian, and a negative binomial or deep AR from uh, AWS, right? Just to quote some. Um, these methods, sorry, oop, would allow you to have, you know, like to have a single shot or recursive for like forecasting, everything is possible, right? So basically you either, forecast all of your uh, values for the future at once, or you do recursive, basically you forecast for time t plus one, use that forecast for time t plus two, t plus three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the main thing is that um, this is what we do using this maximum and like, you know, like this uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimation. And then, you know, we have this big negative point that is, you know, we have to make assumptions. Just to give like, you know, have a, a bit more clear idea on this. Let's try to you know describe what's happening with the deep uh, AR algorithm from AWS. Um, basically, okay, like this is like the network, right? Like this is like the hidden states. And let's say we have the inputs, right? So X X uh, are the covariates. This can be past, future, um, or uh, in the case of uh, in the case of deep AR, it's only if we know in the future, right? Um, but also we can take the lagged values, right? Like the lagged values of the time series, covariates lagged values, right? We pass this to the uh, uh, hidden state, right? At any given time, this hidden state will also take the output of the previous hidden state, right? And then we'll try to output the parameters theta of your distribution, right? Let's say in the case of a Gaussian, the mu and then the, and then the sigma, right? Such that this parameter, you know, have a certain likelihood with respect to the gun truth, right? Which is this here. And, you know, this theta parameters will output, um, you know, parameters such that we have the maximum likelihood between these two, right? The, like basically like, like the ground truth and then uh, your distribution, right? So this is during training time. And, you know, then you pass on to the next hidden state. Um, and during inference, what will happen is that um, you will have similar thing, right? So instead of having, um, you know, like the ground truth, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have your set of covariates you're gonna take the previously um, sampled, uh, sampled, uh, uh, let's say a forecast, right? And then you're gonna put this with hidden state. It will take the output of the previous state and then, you know, output uh, uh, like samples. Here, what we do is that we basically sample a vector, right? It can be not only one value, you can sample, you know, 10, 100, like, you know, you can sample like a vector of values that, you know, follow the likelihood, uh, uh, like from the likelihood of your uh, parameters there, right? And then you take this vector, right? And then you pass it to the next stage. And then you basically, you know, do this, you know, you, like, you, you do this in a recursive way. Um, the fact that, you know, that you're sampling here, right? Will give you at the end, uh, you know, like a robust estimation of your quantiles, right? You can even, you know, estimate quantiles on the, on the, on the, on the distribution. 
Um, yeah, so just like this is you know, like to give you how we can you know model this and then um, you know output the final forecast values with the prediction intervals, right? Um, okay. The second approach that I'm a big fan of is um, you know instead of now uh, giving the output of a distribution, what you're gonna do is learn the quantas of the underlying distribution, right? It means that um, you know you don't need anymore to make any assumptions on the distribution you know you will just learn that right as best as you can this is um, you know usually done uh, by uh, using the pinball loss right um and here you know you have a lot of options as well in terms of modeling um this is you know possible to solve also with broad traditional ml and more recent deep learning models um which is pretty good right like you know if people you know don't want to feel comfortable with using deep learning then they can still do this with uh, ml there are two good implementations that I like. There is you know, like like GBM and Catboost that actually have directly the possibility to have uh, uh, like quanta loss in their uh, in their uh, training. This is nice. You just you know it's an it's an input uh, function that really allows you to enable that. And then you know like the most recent research has been on on this area, right? So we started with using simple MLP. Then we had uh, RN MNQ, CNN MNQ from uh, both from AWS. Then also uh, temporal fusion transformers, where you know we really started using uh, uh, transformer models, right? So it's so it's, so it can really go uh, nuts, um, and it's good because um, you know on the ML and the other side, there's you know like a big discussion, right? Like which one should I use? You know which one should I trust? Um, you know like for the ML, you really have to build a big amount of handcrafted features. Um, it can work pretty well, and it's actually pretty difficult to beat, uh, to be honest. Um, but, you know, it's still required that you do some, you know, let's say chewing before passing to the model. Whereas, you know, most of like, for, like, for example, if you go to uh, temporal fusion transformers, you know, you really have to do a minimum amount of uh, you know, a feature engineering. You just pass the time series, you don't even need to pass the lag values, you know, it, it really is able to learn this, you know, far away memory in the time series. Um, it's good, but, you know, it is a bit more expensive uh, in terms of computation. So when you're having a big, you know, chunk of series, then it becomes kind of a headache to scale up, right? Um, so it's really, you know, like up to you on, um, or up to the, the, like the practitioner, you know, on, on, on when to consider these, like these models and in which order, right? But, you know, the logic goes that we start simple and then we go more complex, basically. Um, so this is um, two methods and it will give you this, right? Like this is a good example from DocTS, that is library, that, you know, you will see that, okay, like we'll have the point forecast and then also the different quantas that you want. Um, it really gives you like a good idea. Okay, like you know, this is rather like a very easy time series that have you know low variance in the past, and you know low noise, and also like the forecasts seem to have relatively low noise. Right? So you basically have this uh, knowledge. Um, yeah, you know, uh, like like the next problem about this is okay. Like I have my data, I have my model, I know my method, right? To train, like you know, how can I evaluate this in a human interpretable way? Like how can I go beyond simply the last function? Um, then we have basically two methods. Um, the first one, uh, you know, is a kind of cheating way. There is, you know, I'm using uh, functions well known for uh, deterministic forecasting by doing a simple trick. It's basically you take the median prediction because you have, you know, like your set of quantile predictions, for example. Then you take your median prediction, right, and then you can use this to, you know, just use very traditional point-wise uh, uh, metrics like e s map Mape or Wape, right? Um, for example, I would love to insist on the on the, on the Wape, that is um, very useful for the math forecasting because we often have a lot of points with zero values. It's and it's actually highly skewed, right? Um, and this kind of you know weights the importance of the value and you know we really, really you know gives you like a good idea. Whereas here, like if you have a lot of zeros, for example, if you predict one, it will give you error one hundred percent, right? Which is you know not 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 good. So like what what they kind of you know weights the error by the importance of the time series basically which is i think pretty good like in the math forecasting um this is you know common to do it's a bit unorthodox but common to do and also common in most libraries that you find uh, there right because it also gives you um human understandable you know metric and allows you to compare also against more traditional deterministic models right like naive baselines like you know rolling mean or trend forecasts arima and exponential scoring so this is something we do Right, unorthodox, but good practice. The second is, you know, if you really want, you know, like to be purist and stay closest to, like, the, you know, like the recommendation, the theory, then you know you can or you should actually use uh, 
probabilistic forecasting specific metrics, right? Um, two come up often. The first one is called continuous ranked uh, probability score. That you know is often referred to as like a, like the closest to uh, like to like a, to a, a generalization of MIE, right? So it's still very understandable. The second one is a cross entropy, that is particularly appreciated in supply chains because it gives a bit more weight and importance to raw events than the previous metric that I gave you, so the CRPS. So both of them are you know useful. It will depend on the stakeholder basically. Um, what I like is, you know, to because it's pretty easy to compute, is to compute them all, but right? have them uh, at the end of the day, and then just, you know, use them as you as you need, basically. Um, yeah. So um, in terms of libraries, like you know, we, I personally like a, like a lot of PyTorch forecasting, right? But you have many other options, right? Like like you have .ts, you have, um, as I said, um, you can use LightGBM directly, CatBoost, SKTAM. There are many many options, and the community, like as you know growing more and more. So it's very positive, but I have, you know, like a personal preference for uh, part of forecasting uh, that I always love, you know, like to kind of push forward. Um, yeah. So, you no know, last part before the, like the questions is, um, you know, how can we, you know, train and, and deploy this? Can you give us an idea of how you do this, right? So we basically do this like this, right? So the training pipeline, all the data sits in the, in the data lake. So we're pretty lucky. Um, we do like the feature engineering and the queries and the joins with Databricks. We store the data on uh, Amazon. Let's say we do this uh, once a week, right? Currently it's once a week training. Um, once it's there, then we trigger uh, the training and then the backtesting job, right? Where we train the model using uh, like multi like several GPUs, right? Because we use PyTorch forecasting it, with uh, PyTorch Lightning, it's so easy to really, you know, like use the cluster of, of GPUs that really makes it, you know, out of the box which I like. And on SageMaker, it's, you know, like it has a good connection. It's very nice. Um, so here we use GPUs for both, right? Uh, for backtesting, we use uh, um, uh, basically a like sliding window approach, very common for evaluation in time series. Um, once we have the model training done, we registered the model in the model registry, the artifacts in S3, right? So this is like the training, very traditional. Um, once we have the model trained, uh, you know, because we're using global models, uh, we don't need to retrain them all the time before using it, right? So we can train a model once and we can use it, you know, um, let's say for several days with the recent uh, data. So this is what happens in the inference pipeline. We start always with the data lake, right? We put the features, we put them in S3. What's in S3, SageMaker, you know, pops up what we call the batch transform jobs that goes and gets uh, the model, the latest model, the data. And basically, you know, it takes each time series is, let's say, one uh, request, one, uh, one, one API request, and then, you know, hits the cluster with saying, hey, can you give me a prediction to this? This is nice because we can use CPU, right? And then you have a big cluster that, you know, can go towards all the 100,000 or, you know, like all the hundred thousands of samples that, that we have. This is very quick and very cheap. So, you know, we can afford to do it every day, basically, right? Um, yeah, and this is still, you know, um, at the end, the output is put to S3. It's given to our stakeholders who are very happy, and that makes me happy. And uh, yeah, still, uh, all the orchestration is done with an internal tool that we call Zflow. Um, this is how it can look like, right? But basically, uh, the important form from my side is, you know, here, like the training, you can really spawn up big clusters of GPUs. If your data is like a lot, you can start with even, you know, simple ML models with GPUs and then go to more complex there, based on, you know, how much you want to pay and you can, you know, afford. Um, then, you know, you, if you, like with this, you know, parallelization trick, you can actually uh, use CPUs and accelerate like the uh, prediction process there. Um, yeah, that was it for today. And I think I'm good for uh, the questions. Yeah, there are quite a few questions, but uh, okay. while listening to your talk, uh, I also have uh, some of my own. And by the way, thanks a lot for presenting all that. So one thing I that um, popped up in my mind was uh, so at the beginning you said that um, we need to be careful when we select the target variable because uh, we what we observe is not necessarily what we want to predict right so because uh, we might not know any information we might not have any in any information about unrealized sales right so when we were out of stock right and maybe somebody wanted to buy something but they couldn't 
And I'm wondering, so how does the target variable look like for you? Maybe I missed that part, but uh, did, did you actually cover that? Yeah, so like, you know, like the target variable is often like, like for most use cases, it's, it's in the sales column, right? Mm -hmm. um, the only difference is that your sales, right, um, equals demand only if you have stocks at the end of the day, right, that go uh, not zero. Mm -hmm. You have stock zero at that given day. The probability is that you know your your sales being you know under uh, representing demand is high because you know you couldn't actually start doing. But if you have sales and you know like for a given of or let's say you have no stock out for a week, right? Like you can estimate that you know that like the sales observed during that week are the demand, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what happens if you have um, for a day you have zero stock at the end of the day? Do you somehow feel uh, treat it as a missing value and fill it with a model, or how does it work? Exactly. So, so that's one of the tricks. So you can either impute it, um, or uh, you know, as I said, like this trick of indicating, okay, like I like I had the stock out. So what? So you're seeing here zero. Uh, like as a feature, right? So, so it becomes a feature. You 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 basically accept it and you make the model kind of you know learn from it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, often indicating is not enough because you still have to impute, right? So, if you basically drag down the value of your series too low by putting zero, like like the overall you know forecast will you know be under forecasting. So you still want to impute, but also play the trick of you know of this indicator. Um, yeah. And uh, you talked a bit about metrics like MAPE, WAPE, uh, entropy, and all this, but I, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how trained your stakeholders are, but I have a hunch that maybe the moment you start talking about entropy, they freak out and say, yeah, go yes. away, I'm not <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> so like, I think this is good for offline evaluation, right? So like, I don't know, in recommender systems, we usually train a model and then there are some offline metrics, but then we deploy a model. And when we do this, we monitor some sort of online metrics. So in your case could be maybe, I don't know, again, this unrealized sales, right? So when you predicted the X amount, but actually the, the actual demand was higher than that, right? So maybe that could be one of the online metrics, right? So what are the other metrics um, so, you can use here? So, I mean, like these metrics are, are um, so I agree that, you know, they are mostly technical, but, you know, we still need mm -hmm. to have. Um, for the others online, like, you know, we, like for, like for example, like in my case, we really focus on the WAPI a lot because mm -hmm. it's you no know, like it's in percentage, it's understandable by the stakeholders and they like okay. it. Okay, so you, you just train them basically. Exactly. So um, the moment they say, I don't understand, you say, okay, come over, let me explain how it works, right? I mean, and I then they walk out with uh, knowledge how it works. Exactly, exactly. I agree that, you know, if it's used as an input to a downstream, you know, application, either human decision or other model, um, let's say inventory optimization, then you know you have some you know impact on the on the uh, on the on the model from like you know on the metric specific to that use case. Uh, but you know for this one at this stage, this is what we get with like, hey like look this is it, and we can basically track the evolution, and we stick with simple so basically what pay. But for us, we still need to understand the others and many of these ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I will share my screen because we have a lot of questions. Yes, uh, and slider, and it will be probably easier for you if you just read them too. So, can you stop sharing yours? Oh, yes, oh, yes, how did it work? Oh, yes, exactly. Okay, now I will share this. So, question from Juan In uh, your experience, which framework or model work best when trying to model hierarchies? Like yes. SA SK time, like maybe let, let's say, <laughs> let's start with the first part. Huh? So. Yeah, so, so this is like a difficult topic because uh, there are different ways to do it, and it depends, you know, on how satisfied you are with these methods, right? Like the traditional way of doing it is um, what we call uh, uh, uplift or downlift, right? Where basically um, you, like I said, you, like you have hierarchies, right? So, you, so you basically uh, start like for the uplift, like for example, you start with the uh, lowest time series, you forecast them, then you can you can basically sum and you know make sure that the uh, like the higher hierarchy forecast is the sum of it. Like this is like like this is tradition and works pretty well um, with um, with deterministic forecasting, but you know not optimal for a probabilistic forecasting. Um, basically, here the question is you know we want to have a coherent you know uh, forecast. 
right? And to my knowledge, there are two good libraries. One is a bit old now, but still good, is uh, Gluon TS. There is a module in it for, uh, for current forecast. And the other one that is pretty new, actually a couple of weeks, I think, that is uh, from Nixla, that I, I, think, I think it's really good that we mentioned it. And it's actually called Hierarchical Forecasting by Nixla. I can write it there. Yeah, maybe I'll try to Google it. Hierarchical forecasting. What did you write Nixla. something? No, no, I was gonna write the name. Yeah. I didn't uh, understand the last word. Nixla. It's N E. Mm. Exactly. X. Like that. Exactly. With an T in the middle. Exactly. You found it. That's it. Nixla. Okay. Yeah. So like this startup is actually pretty good. Um, like you know, I'm He's not. A master. Yeah, but I like I really like them because they put a lot of emphasis on doing things fast and scalable. Like even like even beyond this, they have other uh, models here. For example, um, Arima and expression spoofing that have I think the fastest implementation in the market. So also look at that. But you know, this is one good thing. Um, I know that this is a big challenge, but unfortunately, you know, it's I would say pretty early in the in the in the applicable one. This is pretty new. Mm -hmm. What about the SK time? Have you tried it? No, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think we to... talked a bit about challenges, right? Yeah. So, so the challenges is um, like you know, I don't know on the practical challenges. I only know you know on 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 the on the theoretical elements. So if you like you know on the practical ones, I can't give uh, much there. So you use uh, uplift or how it's called upscaling? Upscaling, yeah. Like you, and then and then the other one is strange. It's called down. So you basically start doing the deterministic forecast for the higher hierarchy, then based on some you know rule or business knowledge or past observation, mm -hmm. basically distribute uh, the forecast to the lower levels based on you know some rules. But that's you know really uh, that's the old way of doing that. I think works at best with uh, deterministic forecasting. So question from Didrik. Uh, how is the uncertainty information in your forecast ultimately ultimately used in business decisions? How was the uncertainty? Mm, okay, let me make sure I understand this correctly. So it's, I, I think my interpretation is like you have these uh, confidence intervals in your predictions. Like remember the question you asked me, like how will this knowing the shape of the distribution influence my decision? And the question is probably ask, uh, asking here, like how is it used in your case? for business decisions. Yeah, so how we use it for, um, so the way we use it is um, two ways. Um, we have manual, so like in my team, right? Like like, like we have many people, um, you know, many teams doing forecasting, like, like in my team, we uh, um, use it for two purposes. Um, the first one is, you know, we pass the forecast with the, with the uncertainties to, uh, to the humans, right? So operational planners that actually, you know, take human decision on top, right? And we found a very uh, simple trick to do it is to use what we call uh, uh, interquartile uh, coefficient of dispersion, right? That basically, like you know, gives you the level of dispersion between the uh, like the quantiles. And then we basically it goes from zero to one, and they see that okay, at some point this is really going towards one. That you know they basically stop. But there's the second, but there's this thing where you know they take the decision, like the final decision. So they really have human intervention. Right. The second is so this is for them very useful to understand how how much they should trust. Sometimes they just don't even look at it because it's so uncertain that you know they trust their own business knowledge that I value a lot as well. Right. Um, then the second one like application is really for downstream stochastic applications like inventory optimization. Then in this case you basically you uh, use your like your like your quantas or distribution to basically do Monte Carlo simulations. That's very common. Basically, you know, like do samples from your uh, from your uh, your distribution. And what do you do with these samples? So you basically pass in the in your in your like let's say like like an like an um, an inventory optimization. You know what you do is you you have like your uh, demand distribution, right? You pass it to your to your um, to your uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Let's say right at the first step, you give an like you have a demand. You simulate your stock. You take a decision, right? At the next level, you sample again. You do uh, like the previous decision, and then you do this certain amount of times over you know different. Mm -hmm. And you basically have an estimation of 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 of, of the variance. So very yes. traditional Monte Carlo simulation, basically. Mm -hmm. So I guess that uh, I will mark. It's a question from Antonio. What is the granularity of the prediction in Zalanda? SKUs, product categories, and if categories, how do you merge the sales? 
I think we talked a bit about that, but you didn't explicitly mention this. You when we were talking about this uplift up uh, scaling or whatever. So you start with SKUs, right? Yeah. So we have um. So actually, we have many teams working on problems based on you know on their on their department. So I can't speak for all of them. I can only speak like for mine, right? Um, basically, we do it, uh, uh, or we try to do it like on three levels. Um, you know, like we like we already have on partner level. Uh, so we like the partners that tend send us the stock. The second is on the country level, and then uh, we're now trying with the SQ level, right? So very low. Um, given that you know, like there's a big problem is that for most of the SQs, for example, we have a cold start problem, right? Because the articles change all the time. It's off season, on season, but so also so many new articles. That you know you can't always forecast on all of them. You only that you know we have so little information that you know it's really difficult to, to take the sum of all SQs, right? And then really make it sure that, that it levels. So we are kind of at this point, um, you know, separating the partner forecast and most likely the SQ forecast. So we don't have this, you know, hierarchical connection. Is it ideal? I don't think so. You know, it's it's a it's a basically like a research topic, and we're like like we're hoping to look at it in the future. Yeah, that's interesting. I was just thinking about the way we do it for recommender systems. And yeah. then it's uh, what typically happens is when it's a cold start problem and we don't have any interactions, we do content based recommendations, which yeah. means like we look at the different characteristics of this and then come up with a, some sort of embedding of an item. And I, I was thinking it's probably possible to do something like this, right? And in, uh, in case of uh, demand forecasting, so you throw in all this title, description, pictures into your network, and then let it figure out what to do, right? Yeah, actually, actually, that's good that that you mentioned that because I was looking like you know some I was doing some gap analysis with the you know some startups in the in the industry, and actually like they do that, right? So like they basically mm -hmm. you know find similarity between the time series, right, with static features. And etc. And then they claim that you know they're able to do like the forecast. We didn't try that yet in my team. Um, but other thing to mention in this case is like on, on the cold start problem, like all the methods that I mentioned, like deep AR and and and, and temporal efficient transformers, are actually uh, in the because they are global, right? Like they learn one, so it's one model through all of the time series. They mm -hmm. actually are able to learn some correlations between them. So they actually perform pretty good based on you know if you have a little information. You still need to wait in you know, a couple of weeks or days, but you, you, I mean, you don't have to wait one year basically like to do like the optimal forecast. Whereas with Arima and exponential smoothing, cold start problem is a big problem basically. So that also helps a bit. Yeah, thanks. So I think then this one we already covered, right? So we talked about Monte Carlo simulations. Mm, yes, exactly. Okay, I think I am just going ahead and marking this as answered. Mm -hmm. Okay, so question from Ellie. Uh, how do we include uncertainty over covariates when building a model? Ah, hmm. Well, this depends on um, uncertainty over covariates when building a model. Mm, that's a good question. So covariates, uh, I always confuse this uh, econometrical um features, features terms <laughs> features yeah exactly so why don't you just use features <laughs> i don't know but well features no yeah no, it's, it's a, it's a, it's okay but i guess features would be like description of the item right sq yeah yeah exactly so i don't know if i understood the question well but um if it's if it's linked to you know like causal uh like causal prediction or let's say causal forecasting well, it depends on the model like there are some models that are good in it like for example temporal fusion transformer has this you know causal inference that allows you, I think, to you know, like measure well the causal impact on the time series. But at the end of the day, right, your like the uncertainty estimation or the prediction intervals are more on the you know on the time series itself, right? So you're more interested like in that, and then you can use you know like the impact of the covariates on that. So it depends on the model, but I think it's possible if I understood the question correctly. Okay, thank you. This one is interesting. So it's about the, the assumptions you're making about the distribution, right? So in, in some cases, when you make a prediction, you have a distribution. And yep. then if you start sampling from distribution, this distribution, you might get a negative value. Yep. Like, okay, for tomorrow, the demand will be minus one, right? Constraints, constraints. So that's a very good question. And usually, like, 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 like for example, DPR allows you to have some constraints. And you can even, you know, put some constraints on the, on the variance, for example, right? So this, this, so this is possible. 
Okay, and uh, so this is the constraints are embedded in the model, right? They are a part of the model. It's not like you do some after prediction cleaning, like you say, everything that is below zero, just let's set it to zero. Exactly. I mean, ideally, like, you know, if your models has seen enough data and, you know, has converged, you, you shouldn't see, you know, go like, uh, at least not your median prediction, right? Um, the quantas might, but it's really like, it means that you know, something is wrong with the model, basically. Mm -hmm. But still probably wouldn't hurt to do some post uh, prediction processing, right? Of course, that's part of the, uh, like, you know, like the, like the, um, Analysis, uh, for your case, you do see that, you know, there is that case, well, then, you know, you, you can potentially sample or at, at least truncate. Okay. So for someone starting out an e-commerce business or doing their first data science projects, project to build up their portfolio, what would you recommend? I guess this is like, how would I choose a project to build up this uh, forecasting skill? I would actually recommend two good books that I like a lot. Um, it's by uh, Nicola van der Poot. I'm sorry, like, um, I didn't have his, like, his permission, but I'm writing down here. It's uh, Nicola van der Poot. And he has very, like, two good books. Uh, if you can do, like, a research, uh, I think it's very so useful. I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Okay. His two books are, I think, Demand Forecasting for, exactly, so the Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasting, as the name indicates. This one, right? Yeah. So this is more on forecasting. And then the other one is what you do with the forecast, which is the blue book, which is inventory optimization. Blue book, this one. Yeah. They are incredibly like well written. Unfortunately, like a lot of these theories in this field are very theoretical. But if you want something more practical, I I feel like I've personally found this book very useful. Mm -hmm. But um, do you, from the top of your mind, do you have any data sets that you would recommend people to play if they want to build a project in demand forecasting? Yeah, uh, on Kaggle, there are many. There's like the uh, mm -hmm. electricity and there's like the M5 competition. So um, you can also use the data there. Mm -hmm. It's very standard. Okay. So basically just go to Kaggle, type in, uh, I don't know. I think they have text, like select a tech time series and then you'll have a lot of. Exactly, exactly. And I think they had a competition. M5. Yeah. Not just one, multiple, right? Yes. Uh, specifically about demand forecasting. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty easy find. I mean, it's a very well known data set. Okay, so I think you mentioned a couple of libraries for uh, probabilistic forecasting. I think you mentioned Gluon TS, right? You mentioned yeah. that uh, library, yeah. the one I gave a star. I already forgot the name. Gluon um, TS, Dart TS that I like a lot, and then there is type of forecasting. Dark TS. So I am just typing everything here so this one nixla i think we talked about this then uh, darts <laughs> and yeah. python yeah. this one this is one very good that actually wraps also other libraries right uh -huh. if you're a purist and you want to use for example um, light gbm or cat boost while well, you use light gbm and cat boost with loss function equals compile ideally it's still possible then PyTorch forecasting. I mean, what I like about these libraries is that they are gaining like a lot of attention. And you know, if you follow like you know like the GitHub and the commits, it's like it's really you know getting more and more attention. So it's pretty nice. Okay, so let's take a couple of more. So um, <laughs> Mikhail. No, I Michael. didn't. So what was the question? I didn't have a chance to read yes. it. You had a look at conformal prediction already. So what is a conformal prediction? Um, I can't. Exp so like to be honest, I I like no no like you know like I don't feel comfortable in order you know like like an even you know like going to, like like into details to it. But basically, um, conformal is you know is your predictions are consistent with the previous you know past observations from my understanding. Um, there's an archive paper on that. I unfortunately so, didn't... gentle introduction to conformal prediction. Exactly. Um, the <laughs> the title seems welcoming. Yeah. It's gentle, not like harsh introduction. Yeah, it's on my uh, list of read uh, of 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 things to read. So which is good because it reminds me that I need to read it. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that 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 takes a while to download. I'm wondering how large it is. I hope. Like how gentle it is. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe there's a bit of uh, irony. It's also irony. yeah. Like some books are 
explicit about that they are like the hard way of uh, like Ruby the the hard way of like something like this. Like you're going to suffer, but like you like it. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is uh, gentle. So okay, come on. Or maybe internet is very slow. Okay, so how it's like. 43 pages. Uh, probably there are nice pictures that just take a lot of space. Mm. Yeah, it looks very nice. Okay, well, okay. Like, this is something to read. Thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, reminding me that that's an important one. <laughs> okay, uh, are you in hurry? Can you take a couple of more questions, or I need to go? Please, let's let's go forward. Okay, so when forecasting monthly demand with seasonality and trend, what is the minimum number of lux you need to include? 24 months or something else? I mean, there is no good answer to that, right? There is, I would say, it depends on your time series. Um, if you have, you know, ideally, you know, um, so if you are, um, you know, doing like more traditional methods like machine learning or, you know, um, ARIMA and expression smoothing, well, you really need to understand your time series very well, right? Like, do you have a business logic? Like, do you have cycles? Do you have seasons? Um, it depends. It can be up to, uh, you know, 12 months, 24 months. They usually, like, the most data, like, the more data you give, better is right um in theory right yeah in, in, the, in theory unless you have you know a complete pandemic so you have to be careful with that but um normally you know if you if you if you like you know these things do know how to you know weight the importance to the uh, last observations compared to like the oldest one so you know they if it's too old they tend to you know really give more importance to the uh, latest of uh, latest information so it's pretty safe yeah, so basically the answer is uh, it depends, right? Go figure out it out, experiment, uh, see how it affects your metric, set up your cross validation, right? And uh, uh, test, but test, even, test. Exactly, but even before you know modeling, please just you know do a simple decomposition of your series and you know understand mm -hmm. how they work. It's it's pretty important. And how how do you do this decomposition? Um, you have libraries for that. Um, for example, Dart.js has an implementation uh, like for that in it. Um, this, you know, you decompose this into different components, right? Like seasonal, trend, cyclical, and then also like, uh -huh. the and then you can understand this. Um, you have to do this for each of the time series. So if you have a lot of them, uh, well, uh, good luck. But you know, if you sample some series, you can have an understanding of how your, you know, samples are are behaving. But it's a very manual thing to do. Do you have any idea what log cosh quantile means? Because I do not. I also do not. <laughs> So let's see. Uh, there is probably a paper, like gentle introduction to Lokosh. No, I guess uh, these are um, losses. But from the question, the, I understood that uh, maybe it's a loss that is you can use in XGBoost. Like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I know that they don't have a direct quantile there. I like I tend to use LightGBM. Um, that's a quantile. That's a thing about loss. But uh, this one, so I really can't answer. Okay, maybe past one. Yeah. So, what do you recommend among classical ML and deep learning approaches from for e-commerce demand? You probably covered most of this. Maybe just like as a summary. Yeah, as a summary, um, I would always recommend that you have uh, like this, you know, approach from simple models to more complex one. Right. Um. Try to always, you know, have naive baselines actually first, like mean predictions, trend predictions, or less known value predictions. Right. On top of that, if you can um, still do ARIMA or exponential smoothing, you have libraries that do it very quick. Like as I mentioned, Nixla is very quick in that. Um. You know, that's still good, even if you're interested, like in probabilistic forecasting. Having that, you know, median or let's say point forecast is still good to compare, right? For your like your median uh, forecast. Then you know it's up to you, but really go in terms of complexity. So start with a real exponential smoothing, then ML, then the L that you know requires more money. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, like I remember I was reading some uh, solutions on Kaggle. So mm -hmm. what they do is they first go with simple models like Arima and exponential smoothing yeah. and trends, but then instead of throwing them away and then using like XGBoost. So they just take all these predictions and then throw them in as features and then they uh, build like, yeah, uh, 
Yeah, that's always uh, funny to, to see. And actually, some companies end up implementing this. So I guess like if it's a simple model like exponential smoothing, running it for all the million time series you have in your database, uh, it's not that difficult, maybe. No, so it's not. I mean, again, like like you like you really have to be comfortable with the feature engineering because when you go mm -hmm. like ML, it doesn't require you to do that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like you know, DL is fancy, but it really tends to be difficult if you scale or you really have to reduce the size of the model if you have a lot of sample series. So I would say it's pretty close to what we do in machine learning in general. Start simple, go more complex. Mm -hmm. So my understanding from your last couple of slides is you went with deep learning approaches, right? Yeah, so we went with exactly like like, like a simple one. Um, you know, we have the simple ones, so naive baselines, uh, Arima, exponential smoothing. Then we have like the more complex ones, um, mm -hmm. because really uh, it limits the amount of feature engineering. Um, but to be honest, we also have to look at uh, like there is it's part of our research plan, right, to really compare this uh, with extra boost, and as you know, if it really gains a lot. Um, yeah, but we have to do like this feature engineering that is a different pipeline. So we unfortunately left uh, quite a few questions unanswered and probably people who watch this in recording will have even more questions. So what's the best way to reach out to you if they want to ask you something? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, LinkedIn is a good, uh, LinkedIn is a good one. Um, it's under my name, right? Hago mm -hmm. Dippel. Probably there are not so many people with the same first name, last name. Oh, it's, it's a strange mix. If you really want the full name, there is my name before the wedding. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can even find it, like, to be precise. Um, okay. yeah, just, you know, just drop a message if you want to work mm -hmm. with us, for example, or, you know, if you have any questions, just contact me. Yeah, why you didn't mention that, actually? You're hiring, right, aren't you? Yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> we are hiring, Zalando is hiring, yeah. absolutely, and, okay. and also my team, so, um, yeah, contact us. <laughs> so, please do send me the links, like your LinkedIn, your jobs, and we will include them in the description. And, yeah, thanks a lot, Hagop. It was a really nice, engaging presentation. Um, so thanks for sharing all that and thanks everyone for joining us today for sticking around for asking questions for being active yeah thanks everyone